Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel, and after conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware of passing that place, because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elijah warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elijah the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go, find out where he is, the king ordered so that I can send men to capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. This is God's word for God's people. Thank you, Cindy. Couple weeks of Old Testament scripture in a row here. This is three weeks, I think, now, right? <coughs> so, how was your week? Ah, I knew that was coming. That was, that was already on my list. Um, I, I wrote down earlier in the week. I'm hoping and praying that you had a place to go over the past few days where you could stay cool at least for a little while. Uh, I know. I know. Yesterday at the 5K race. Really, it was really nice. Uh, it was a little bit muggy, and, and clouds were around. And when we all first got here and started to set up, but uh, by the time mid, about midway, right, about, right, that probably tells us better about Paper Road. Man, the sun was starting to come out, and it was hot. It was deep. It was pretty. It was pretty intense. But um, yeah, we did all right. We got in, and got out. I think a lot of people were appreciative that we, we had an 8 a.m. start because it was it was pretty hot. Um, I hope and pray that, uh, that some of you who are helping uh, are not worn out yet. It just started from fair work uh, or, or what's to come. Uh, that you're not going to be too worn out this week as you uh, go and help and do. Uh, and I pray that the, even last week and, and uh, the coming week that you're going to have time to engage, time to uh, find God in Scripture, find Him in prayer. Uh, find him in some way uh, to engage him this week. Uh, he's uh, there. He's wanting to hear from us. He has been engaging with you, and I pray that uh, it's leading you to serve, it's leading you to do something for somebody else. It's where you find him in, in the doing, uh, not necessarily in the hiding, right? Uh, I mentioned to somebody uh, the old cliche, I don't know if it's cliche or or an old, uh, whatever you want to call it, an old thing that somebody once said, where this is not a, a, uh, a museum for the righteous, uh, this place should be a hospital for the sick. Um, and uh, it's kind of a paraphrase on one of the things that Jesus said. So, um, don't, uh, <clears throat> don't think that this is a place to come and, and be better than someone else. Uh, this is a place to come and, and be yourself and be... <clears throat> moved. Remember, God is still working. Do not be afraid. There is enough. You are enough. Right where you are. So it was, yeah, it was two weeks ago that we talked about Solomon, right? We talked about this inheritance. What do we, what do we get from God in this inheritance? Well, Solomon asked for wisdom. 
which is something that we inherit from the word of Christ. Uh, last week, we talked about uh, attention. And we, we saw where Elijah, right, because today we have Elisha. So Elijah was uh, worried. He was concerned that everybody was, they were coming to kill him. He was the last one left. And so God had to reassure him that he is there, uh, just like he does us. And now today, we're finding God speaking to Elisha. And this, in, in this moment in, in time, the Arameans are at war with the Israel, people of Israel. And so they are uh, conquering the land back and forth. They're fighting back and forth. And it seems as though every time uh, the king of the Arameans is going to go and, and attack, the, the Israelites have either moved or are prepared. And he's getting frustrated. He's mad. Like, what is happening? How are they able to figure this out? And so he realizes, uh, as his, uh, he, he addresses his own people, he's afraid that there's a traitor in their, in their midst, right? And he says, which of you is the traitor who's been informing Israel of my plans? It's not us, but there's this prophet named Elisha who can tell them everything. He can even... Tell them the words you speak in your bedroom. I'm like, Ooh, wow, that's uh, pretty intense. And so they found where Elisha was going to be, where because where, they thought, well, if we can get rid of this guy, then we can get rid of this this God who is guiding and guarding and protecting them, right? And so they're going to go and they're going to get rid of them. So uh, the servant of the man of God. So Elisha's servant, his helper, whatever you want to call it, butler, but I don't know that they had them at that moment in time. Um, he got up early and he went outside and he sees troops and horses and chariots everywhere. And he's like, oh no, Elisha, what are we going to do? And Elisha said, don't be afraid. Crazy. There it is again. <laughs> Elisha said, don't be afraid. And for there are more on our side than there is on theirs. And the young, I could have just have done a picture of the, the young servant, the young friend of his that's there to help him. And like, what are you talking about? There is nothing here. You're crazy. And Elisha does something. He, he prays, oh, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw the hillsides covered. Around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Now I can understand it, but I, even if I was Elisha, maybe Elisha was the one that knew because he could see those things. He was in tune. He had that connection with God. He was engaged with God. And he, he knew. He could see what it was that God had already planned. That's how he knew where the king was sending his, his troops. Elisha was never afraid. He was never afraid. And the part that gets me the most is that this person, right? This, this person who's with Elisha all the time. He... He's there in, in his side. He, he's, you know, he's a part of this. And yet he has no clue what's happening. It reminds me of disciples, right? When they were around Jesus, right? They had no idea. I mean, he would say something and they could be like, what? Really? And then it would happen and then they would be like, oh. Oh, yeah. Even he, and he did that constantly over a period of a few years. And then finally he died. And then came back to life. And they're like, oh, you were serious about that. <laughs> this is that same moment. This is God's power. And, and God's with you. His strength and his might, is, it's with you. You might think that the enemy is all over you. You might think that the end is near. You might think, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> You might think that you lost the battle, but I pray for you this morning is that the Holy Spirit opens your eyes and lets you see it. 
and that you can see your horses and chariots of fire that are here surrounding you and helping you. You are not in this alone. When Christ died on the cross for your sins, you were forgiven. You were forgiven, forgiven of any sin that you committed. And this includes sins now and sins to come. But God does not want you to stay in your sin. He does not want you to reside there. He wants you to live. He wants you to feel what it is to have that relationship. He wants you to feel what it's like to, to be able to see those chariots and those horses. He wants you to know that you are assured of your salvation. He wants you to know that he is by your side, that you are not alone in this, and that he is with you through the thick and the thin. He wants you to know that he's done everything within his power to provide for you everything you would need. And I know it doesn't always seem like it. I think it's been great working in the Old Testament and seeing this, this God of, of Israel and, and what he was doing back then and how all of this is a, a great translator into who God is and what he is and in light of the coming of Christ, which was all in there. We talk about Jesus and what he meant to the world, and, and it's about God welcoming everyone into his family. Everyone. Jesus uh, is, is, is there's a, one of my favorite pieces, and I heard it, I said it last night, uh, and, and, and Chris was candlelight, and I heard it this morning uh, as I woke up and, and turned some noise on in the background. It's usually uh, on Sunday mornings, it's usually Charles Stanley. And, and he was in John chapter 3. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh that's awesome, because I've been there all week. It's been on my mind all week. And so Jesus is approached at night by a Pharisee. If you go back to John 3 and go back to the beginning of this, the, the chapter, everybody knows what John 3.16 is, right? It's like the most downloaded, quoted verse in the Bible, right? But if we go back, find out where it comes from. Contextually, there's a Pharisee who's coming to Jesus, Nicodemus, and, and he's concerned that Jesus might be right. And that these other Pharisees that he's aligned himself with are really wrong. Now, he can't just come out and say it. He's got to hide it. He's got to do it in the dark of night because nobody can see him go to Jesus. So he's got to do this without being seen. If not, he's going to lose it, right? He's going to be lynched and taken away. And so he goes to him at night and, and questions all of the things that Jesus is saying. And that's where Jesus says, well, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about? I can't go back into my mother's womb. That doesn't work physically. And Jesus says, no. You have to be born again of the Spirit. You have to live as a new creation. You have to believe in me. And then Jesus uses the Old Testament to talk about this power that's not only already here, but what is to come. And he goes back to Numbers 21. In 21, Numbers 21, Moses is struggling, and the people of Israel, they're all dying because these venomous snakes have come into their camp, right? God has freed them from slavery in Egypt. They are moving into the, they're in the wilderness, waiting to find the promised land, and these snakes have come. And then anybody that gets bit by one of these snakes dies. And so Moses says, God, what do we do? I, 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 we need your help. Just like Elisha, God says, hey, grab that snake right there and wrap it around this pole, and I want you to hold up the pole. And anyone who looks upon this pole, if they are bitten by the snake, they won't die. And so Moses does. Moses takes this snake and he holds it up. And anyone who's bitten by the snakes don't die. Those that look upon the pole. And so in John chapter 3, Jesus uh, explains this story to Nicodemus. And he says, you are a respected Jewish teacher and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen. And yet you won't believe our testimony. 
But if you don't believe me, when I tell you about earthly things, how could you possibly believe me if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven in return. But the Son of Man has come down from heaven, and as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Jesus, on a cross, was our serpent on a pole. He goes on then to give the rest of that message to him, right? For this is how God loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son so that anyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save it. Amen. Come on. This Jesus is not hiding. He was crucified. He was raised on a pole. Right? Even Jesus, at this moment in time where he is interacting with Nicodemus, he knows what has to happen in order for people to not perish at the hands of sin and death. He has to be lifted up. He has to be sacrificed and raised so that anyone who looks upon him will be saved. We all have this power. We all have this grace. We have the same forgiveness. But so often in our lives, we seem very rarely to accept it. Why is that? What is it about that? We have a method for assuring our eternity. We have the Son of God who came to earth to die for us, and yet we are still so wrapped up in ourselves and in our wants and in our needs that we forget about who is really in charge. We forget that He loves us with an absolute love, and that he would send chariots of fire to our aid should we need him. Why have we stopped believing in God? That same Holy Spirit that empowered disciples to begin the church is still here. They did not stand upon their own free will. Matter of fact, before the Holy Spirit arrived that day, they were still hiding, weren't they? Of course, they were following instructions and waiting. They were still in hiding. They were still afraid. I think of the Apostle Paul, who encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and was blinded, had an experience with him, understood at that moment, okay, yeah, that guy is who he says he was. He goes on to, to, to write a lot to the people of different places and churches, and he writes this in Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. This is what Paul has been praying for the people in Ephesus. He says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead, seated him in a high place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Yeah, that same power, that's at your disposal. And my prayer for us is today that we begin to see God working and moving. I pray that God opens our eyes, that we will get to see, maybe not specifically horses and chariots of fire, maybe metaphorical horses of chariots and fire, and that that is going to give us an idea of this greater power that God has for us. God wants you to win. He wants you to win so badly that he's already fixed the game. You already win. But so many of us, we don't live there. We live in the, we live in the grief. We live in the disturbed. We live in the horrified. We live in the world that, that we see with our eyes. God would not have ever sent his son to die for you if he did not want you to win. He loves you more than you could possibly know, and he simply wants you to cry out to him. He wants you to see that you have access to that power here. He wants you to cry out like Moses in the wilderness. He wants you to talk as though you are Elijah talking to your friend, right? He wants you to, to talk like Jesus talked to Nicodemus. He wants you to understand that his son is hanging 
standing on a tree and he wants to see that you have that life ahead of you. Stop storing up treasures here on earth. Stop thinking about your problems and your things that are going wrong. Stop letting this world get the best of you. This is not the end. You have a great power at your disposal, and it's time to believe in it. It's time to receive it. It's time to take a hold of it. Instead of watching it go by, this won't make all your troubles disappear. This world is still this world, and it's still going to stink. But it will seem pretty small in the sight of the great power of God. Are you ready for that kind of power? I'm ready. Amen.